Philip Cly is here with his new novel, Missionaries, the story of U.S. military involvement in drug wars and civil wars in the nation of Colombia. The novel comes with high praise on the book jacket from two authors who recently joined us here in person, Garth Greenwell and Ayad Akhtar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here at in-person events again after more than a year on Zoom. We love spending time with you, even if we all need to be masked. We ask that the audience members remain properly masked throughout the event. Speakers are allowed by university policy to remove masks while socially distanced and speaking at the front. Books are for sale outside the space, and we invite you to stick around afterward to get one signed and to chat with the author. Masks need to stay on for that as well. To introduce Phil Clyde and host this conversation, we're extremely pleased to have Professor Alexander Dawson, Graduate Director of History and Professor in both Departments of History and Latin American, Caribbean, and U.S. Latino Studies. It's an honor to have Alec here to enrich this conversation with Phil because, among other reasons, he teaches a course at the university on the subject of Latin American drug wars. It's amazing to learn that those conflicts extend as far back as the 17th century. Dr. Dawson's recent book, published in 2018 by the University of California Press, presents the epic historical span and scope of those conflicts. Its title is The Peyote Effect from the Inquisition to the War on Drugs. The reviewer for the Western Historical Quarterly said, deeply researched and conceptually rich, the peyote effect makes an important contribution to the history of drugs, race, medicine, Native American and indigenous studies, borderlands history, and the history of the US and Mexico. Please give a warm welcome to Alexander Daw Dawson and Phil Clyde. Uh, thank, thank you, is, is this on, is it on? By the way, I, I do want to say that um, it was not one of Obama's favorite books of the year, <laughs> and I'm still feeling a little bit tender about that. <laughs> it is a total pleasure. It is a total pleasure to have uh, Phil Claw here. Um, I, I just want to talk. I want to give a little bit of deep background to introduce you to him, um, and uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions. But as I as I ask these questions, I'm not going to take too much time because I'd also really uh, like to have opportunities for the audience to engage in a conversation, uh, asking him about his book, asking him about his, his history, asking him about what it was like to grow up in Westchester County. I don't know, you know. <laughs> in any event, I, as you may not know, or as you should know now, uh, Phil, Phil, you grew up in Westchester County, New I did. York. I did, yeah. Um, Phil, uh, Phil comes from a long history of people involved in public service. Um, you, you, I, I think your maternal grandfather was in the diplomatic service. Yes. Uh, your father served in the Peace Corps. Yep. Um, and it, it, it strikes me as, that this long history of public service in your family sort of shaped a certain series of decisions you made in life. Not not the decision to go to Dartmouth, right? But but the decision in the midst of the 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 uh, the war on terror in the aftermath of mm -hmm. the invasion of Iraq, you decided to do something that I think remarkably few Dartmouth students ever choose to do, and that was to join the Marines. Um, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of services you can join. You can join the, the Coast Guard, you can join the Merchant Marine, you can join all sorts of things that are much, much easier, but to join the Marines is one of the most difficult kind of services to enter into. And you, you did that in the, in the aftermath of, uh, I mean, I guess you did officer training for, for the Marines uh, while you were still in college. Yep, and, in 2004. And then you, and then you, you joined full-time in the Marines, and you were deployed for um, for the better part of two years. Uh, uh, well, for 13 months, so from yeah. January 2007 to February 2008. In Anbar province mm -hmm. in Iraq, yeah. um, which, um, I mean, obviously is an experience that, that, that uh, very few people understand or could describe, and it, and it seems quite clear that it was something that you found meaningful as a way of uh, thinking about what the rest of your life was going to be. Um, in particular, uh, shaped you as a as a writer coming out yep. of that. Um, your first uh, book, uh, uh, it was a Redeployment, right? Yes. Came out in 2014. Mm -hmm. 
It was not Obama's favorite book of the year, but it did win the National <laughs> Book Award. <laughs> it did win the National Book Award. He did like it, though. What? He did like it. But not his favorite. <laughs> 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 because this book, the book we're about to talk about, was Obama's, Barack Obama's favorite book of 2020. And I don't... I don't One of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's a, <laughs> what I hear was the name. <laughs> in any event, uh, Redeployment uh, won the National Book Award, won a huge amount of, a huge number of awards, and became part of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a period in which you've been publishing the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic... Um, other things. Um, I'm trying to remember. The New Yorker, of course. I left the New Yorker off. Everybody's, you should never leave the New Yorker off because that's obviously the most important one. Um, and then you ultimately, uh, at the end of this process, after a six-year period of writing uh, and teaching, you've been teaching in the graduate uh, MFA program at Fairfield, uh, you produced this book, uh, this uh, book, The Missionaries, or Missionaries in, mm -hmm. in, in 2020. Again, Barack Obama's favorite book of the year. Um, I, I, this is a remarkable story, and let me just introduce it to, to those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Um, it it's told in, uh, from multiple perspectives, the voices of several different people, including a, a female journalist, a young orphaned um, uh, Colombian kid named Abel. It's told from the perspective of some people who are, uh, who are involved in, in the guerrillas. It's told from, 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 uh, from some Afghanistani perspectives. It's told from the perspective of a, of a, of a high-ranking officer in the Colombian military and from, one of his, from his daughter. And it's also told from the perspective of several people who have various positions within the U.S. Special Forces. Um, one is a current Special Forces and several others either are former uh, who have either moved into the shall we say, informal special forces sector or who have, who, or who have, who have been, um, because of injury, have, have, have been uh, retired. Um, it's a story that's not just about Colombia. It's a, story, it's a story about Afghanistan. It's a story about the United States. Um, uh, it's very much a story about the political and social conflict in Colombia. But it's, it's importantly also a story about modern warfare. Yeah. Right? And particularly, and again, I, I really think of the, the, the real thing that comes right at the end of the text when, when, um, when the Colombian uh, lieutenant colonel moves to, to Yemen, or he's not in Yemen, he's in the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. And he's killing people in this, Yemen from yeah, the Emirates, yeah. Is a, is a really deeply chilling kind of story that concludes, that, that you see at the end we've been leading all the way towards, but it's it you almost it, it's about a, a, a denationalized military. Yeah. It's about technology and it's about where we are and where we are going. And it and it's coming out of the Afghanistan conflict. It's coming out of the Colombian conflict. But it's it's being lived at the end of the of the of the book in in Yemen, which um, you write about in these very chilling in a very chilling fashion. And I don't mean that critically. Like it's a very chilling fashion. Um, for, so my first question is, did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, thanks for coming out to, to listen to me talk about modern war <laughs> and, and writing. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, as you mentioned, I've been thinking about war, writing about war for, you know, oh, two decades now, basically, right? I, I went to college September of 2001. Uh, we were soon at war, and you know I, I had always wanted to be in the peace, in, not in the Peace Corps, in the in the Foreign Service, like my maternal grandfather. Uh, but we were at war. We were a nation at war when I was in college. So it seemed to me that the thing to do was to join the Marines. Um, an older brother who had joined already. I'm one of uh, five boys. So sort of, you know, early life was warfare. Um, uh, so it seemed natural. Um, but, um, you know, uh, my first book was about Iraq. And, you know, you mentioned that having gone to war really did shape my trajectory as a writer. I think that I'd always written. Writing was always the way that I knew, you know, it was the best way to make sense of the world because, you know, when you put something down, you take these, like, ideas that you have that you feel so sure about and you put them into fiction and all of a sudden they feel thin and false because the characters aren't fully lived in, and so you have to actually, you know, breathe life into these people and circumstances, and that ends up sort of destroying whatever you thought you knew about the world, right, and exposes all the gaps um, and forces you to, to sort of 
approach something in a deeply human and, and more lived in way. Um, but prior to Iraq, I, you know, I'd written and tried to write good stories. When I came back from Iraq, I felt like there was something that I had to communicate. I didn't know what it was, right? And ultimately, the thing that I would have to communicate would be something that I'd have to figure out in the writing of it. Um, but, and it could only be done through story. But the more that I wrote and the more that I thought about modern war, uh, the more it seemed insufficient to just talk about one, right? If you can have, as happens at the end of the book, which you mentioned, a Colombian mercenary who is uh, looking through the optics of a Chinese drone, coordinating over Swedish communications technology with an Emirati pilot to help him drop an American bomb on a Yemeni tribesman, right? You're dealing with something which is complex and is not a story that can be localized to one country, right? And, you know, in many ways, Colombia was a perfect place to write about. Um, my wife is Colombian American, so it helped to have family in Medellin who we could go stay with when I was doing research and they helped me uh, get interviews and such. Um, you know, my wife helped, you know, like, there are some interviews we're doing where she's like literally like nursing a baby and helping because <laughs> my Spanish, you know, is not that great. So helping with the, uh, the interview. Um, but, uh, but on top of that, it's been the largest recipient of military aid in the Western Hemisphere since the end of the Clinton administration. And people and tactics and strategies kept migrating from one conflict to the other. So, you know, if you think about one of the you know, primary things in modern warfare, which is targeted killing, targeted assassination, right? People tend to think of drone strikes, um, uh, but also special forces raids, special operations raids. Well, uh, targeted killing is not just about the sort of mechanism of death, right? In 2004, Joint Special Operations Command was doing maybe 12 raids a month. By 2006, they're doing about 250, right? It's not because the Navy SEALs went to the gym and got a lot more buff, right? It's because the way that we did targeting changed. The way that we integrated intelligence services and t technologies and direct action units in a sort of loop to make sure, to make the sort of cycle from getting, gathering intelligence to exploiting it and actually, you know, uh, acting on it uh, was as fast as possible. That methodology a lot of the early stages of that began with the hunt for Pablo Escobar, right? It's things that we did in, in Pablo Escobar hunt that were then used in Bosnia, that then got bumped up to an industrial scale uh, in Iraq to the point where you had this extremely sophisticated, high-speed mechanism system for killing people. Most people think drones are kind of creepy. Most people think special, you know, like Navy SEALs or whatever are kind of cool, but those are just the flathead and the Phillips head screwdriver at the end of the targeting system. That system we can apply in other countries. And we applied it back to Colombia and helped the Colombians kill high-ranking um, members of communist guerrilla groups, right? And so there was that. There was the fact that every ambassador to Colombia uh, that we sent ended up working in the war on terror. Two ended up having their next posting to be the ambassador to Afghanistan. One of them later said there was no place we had more going on than Colombia, right? And so there were just all these connections, right? And special forces units like the 7th Special Forces Group, which is supposed to be focused on Latin America, but did deployment after deployment in Colombia and had some of the most violent deployments of any special forces group in Colombia in the 2000s, one of which I, I sort of uh, narrate in the book. Uh, and so, you know, trying to get a handle on how America is projecting force around the world, what it means, what it looks like on the ground to people who live in the communities are going to be affected, what it looks like in the militaries, not the American militaries, but the host nation, the, the other militaries that we work with, right? What it looks like from the American military side, what it looks like to an American journalist, you know, trying to combine all those things, it's the sort of thing that only a novel could do, right? Um, uh, and so that's what I tried to write. And it was sort of the nature of how I was thinking about modern war that forced me into this kind of form and structure for the novel um, because it's so diffuse, because it can get very abstract, right? Um, and yet a novel sort of concretizes it with specific people and specific narratives.
Is this, this is good? Okay. So let me ask you the, <laughs> the, the hardest question first, and then I'll All give right, you some bring time. it on. So um, you are, um, a, as a participant in American literary circles, aware of how much criticism people come under mm -hmm. in this day and age for writing the voices that are other than their own, sure. right? Um, you know, the um, American Dirt and other novels have been. And so when, when one starts this novel, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the very, isn't the very first story about? Yeah, about? yeah it's about. And, um, and so when I, I, I got to honestly tell you, when I start reading it at the very start, and again, I'm, uh, I'm a Latin American historian, and I'm, I follow these debates closely, and I thought for a second, oh my god, this is a former U.S. Marine <laughs> writing in the voice of a victim of the paramilitaries in Colombia. This is, this is, I thought, oh my god, this is going to be trouble, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, will say, I, I will say, as I read the novel, what I discovered was that it's, it, it's, it's a question of polyvocality, right? Like mm -hmm. you're writing in a lot of different voices, but you're also writing in the voice of a female journalist, you're writing in the voice of a, colonel, of a, of, of a Colombian lieutenant colonel, you're writing in the voice of a, of a, of a, of a, para, of, of a para, right? Um, and you're writing in the voice of these multiple special forces people. So my question is, um, A, it's a multi-part question. One is, have you faced criticism for writing in the voice of Lizette and Abad? Uh, did you consider a different strategy. Um, uh, why was it that the strategy mm -hmm. that you chose? Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it with that. No, not really. I mean, and and um, uh, I haven't really faced criticism for it. Okay. Um, you know, I think there's something. The reason that I chose the strategy is. <laughs> let me put it this way. I'm not writing. In other perspectives, out of some sort of like literary tourism, yeah. right? I am an American writer writing about the impact of American military policy around the world, yeah. right? That demands that I write from other perspectives. Yeah. That demands that I write from Abel's perspective. It demands yeah. that I write from Juan Pablo's perspective. Um, it also demands that I write from special forces. I mean, I was in the special forces, yeah. right? And, you know, people assume that I can write from that perspective because Mason is like a, he's like a white guy who's yeah. in the military and I'm a white guy who's in the military. Yeah, but there's a big a difference <laughs> in the military between like a pogue, yeah. you know, like me, yeah. versus like a guy who's in a lot of combat, right? That is an extremely intense, and I am, you know, I am uh, other perspective to get into, but that's the novelist's job. You know, your job is also to, to do your homework, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, make sure that you, uh, <sighs> are aware of the sort of uh, cultural and political conversation into which you're writing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you're not, if you don't want to trespass on yeah. anybody else's vision of the world, you can't write at all. You can't even write a damn memoir, right? Because my story is the story of all the people around me, right? Yeah. Um, my story as an American, yeah. right? is the story of, of <laughs> and as an American military man, is yeah. the story of people from very different cultures, right? Yeah. Who I've impacted um, and who I never ha nevertheless have a relation to. And I think that the, the idea of the novelist is that you can, not just the novelist can try and enter into these other experiences and try and um, uh, talk about them, um, but that communi real communication is possible, right? Uh, that somebody is going to read what I've written and take something up from it that I couldn't, you know, possibly have imagined or seen in it. Um, so no, I haven't really faced criticism uh, from it. And thankfully, you know, um, one of my favorite Colombian novelists, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, who's absolutely brilliant, reviewed the book in, in the New York Times yeah. and praised the the accuracy of its depiction of the. Who Columbia. himself has written a book about the Colombian drug wars, The yes. Sound of Things Falling. That's a brilliant book. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, it's amazing. You um, know. Yeah. I, I would, the, the point you make about Mason, this character, the Mason is a medic working in, in the Special Forces. He's the son of a coal miner. Yeah. Um, from, is it West Virginia? Yeah, Virginia? he's from around Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so, um, obviously, I mean, your point about Mason also being very different from you is, is a really important one. You know? he's, he's different from me in so many ways, right? And, yeah. you know, like, there's a bit in that book where he's a medic and he's, He's performing life-saving surgery on one of his friends, yeah. right? One of the guys that he serves with. This is Ocho, right? Uh, yeah, Ocho. Yeah, Ocho. <laughs> um, 
and you know that is a you know intense and very specific set of circumstances too i mean i think i think that you know oftentimes our discussion of these things is fairly superficial yeah. right um you know what what but it is important i think for the writer to have respect um for and the thoughtfulness about the culture yeah. that you're writing into um but you have to do it. You have to do it in order to understand who you are in the world, right? That particular passage you're describing of the of the incident where Ocho loses both of his legs is mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. That was um, that was really impactful, but also really beautifully written. Thank um, you. Uh, just uh, I, I the description of the of the injury and the moment of it and the it was it was searing, you know. Um, but let me just ask you one more question on this, and others, oh, um, we're ready for others to ask questions, but I, uh, but I, is there a character in this novel that um, you're closer to, and maybe <laughs> one that you feel like you had more difficulty writing? So, in the writing of it, it's not so much about, like, who I'm closest to, because I don't have a lot in common with, like, Abel, right, yeah. who's a, from a very poor, rural region in Colombia on the Venezuelan border um, that has been sort of, you know, the, the political authority in that region has sort of switched hands between communist guerrilla and paramilitary groups and neo-paramilitary groups and, and narcos, um, you know, throughout his life, okay? His sections were actually sort of easier to write, not because not because I knew that world. I had to do a lot of research, you know, um, in order to be able to write any of these characters. But because um, the way that he tells his story and the way that his mind works, it's it's straight ahead, yeah. right? And the journalist is the same, Lisette. Yeah. Um, you know, so he sort of begins and he moves forward. Uh, and one thing leads to another. And so, you know, when I was writing him, I was on a roll. Uh, other characters, specifically Mason and Juan Pablo, who's a yeah. uh, high-ranking um, Colombian military guy, they have a sort of naughtier thought process, and sort of every event is kind of layered with history, yeah. right? Um, and those were much more challenging to write um, because you want to have, you know, this is a complex novel. I want it to be as readable as possible. I want it to be as propulsive as possible. Uh, I want each chapter to be, you know, tightly written, no fat on it, um, propulsive, moving forward, but without sacrificing any of that kind of complexity of thought and the way that they think about and approach their life and, 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 and um, where they're moving. And to be able to manage that with that type of voice and consciousness is just more of a pain in the ass. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not, it's not about, like, who was harder to get into so yeah. much as what kind of technical demands that put in terms of pressure on the writing. I'm sorry, I, I will take questions at any point. Um, but I, I, I can also continue with my questions, because you, you've made me think about Juan Pablo a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you know he was going to the United Arab Emirates right from the start? Not right from the start, but very early on. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I can't, I, so I, I have an aunt who uh, has worked in sort of humanitarian and immigration law yeah. for a while. And when I was talking about, um, this book that I was working on, uh, at one point she was like, oh yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of Colombian mercenaries in the Emirates. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that is the ending. That's the ending of the book. And, and, how, and how, at what point were you in the process of writing the book? I mean, this is early, okay. uh, you know. I, I know that there are students in the room and some of you are probably thinking about being writers, so maybe I can ask you a few kind of more technical questions. Sure, about yeah. how you, So. Um, It, the book took six years to write. Yeah. Did you, at what point, did you outline the entire thing long before? Mm -hmm. Did you write it? Did you unfold as you wrote it? Like, what was the, 
What was the process like for you? Um, so I knew what the overall structure was going to be. Yeah. Um, so I knew that I wanted to sort of hit different levels, right? So for me, I hate a kind of fiction that like has a point to make and it's going to deliver its point to you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to explore a modern war, yeah. but I didn't want to have like characters who are like, now nah, I'm going to explain modern war to you and this is how you should feel about it. So what I wanted to do was set up structurally in terms of the characters that I was writing and where I was situating them, that they would just naturally be forced to navigate these environments that are critical to understanding how America yeah. does violence around the world. Um, but that would leave me the freedom to just follow these characters, yeah. right? As I sort of, um, you know, tried to breathe more and more life into them. Um, so, you know, I was going to have, you know, one, you know, Abel is sort of closest to the ground. When America kills, you know, when, when, um, when Colombian, the Colombian military does a targeted assassination in his region of a, a drug lord. There's a scene in the book that's based on a real thing that happened where sort of uh, narco, special ordered a six foot tall teddy bear for his girlfriend, like you do. Um, if you've never special ordered a six foot tall. I think it was pink as well, right? Yeah, teddy bear for your significant other, then you have less love in your heart than uh, this savage, murderous narco. Um, and they, they implanted a beacon into it, and so they could track it to the birthday party and then hit the birthday party and kill them. So that ha that happened in real life. So you know, and a lot of the stories in um, U.S. popular culture on the war, war focus around special operators and raids, and you can sort of see why they're very sort of narratively satisfying. It's like there's a bad guy. Hardy American warriors have to train up to kill the bad guy, and then they you know they go and then they kill him. And it's very dramatic, and then that's the end of the story, right? There's a neat beginning, middle, and end to those kind of stories. Just like narratively, they're satisfying. Um, but any story about modern war that has a neat beginning, middle, and end is sort of fundamentally a lie, right? Um, and so instead of having like a raid be the end of the book, I have that raid dead in the middle of the book. And what happens in a region where the Colombian government doesn't control the political structure in the region in any meaningful way, when you kill somebody powerful in that region, it's not like all of a sudden the region is like, now we will be Denmark, right? What happens is a power struggle or a power vacuum, right? And so Abel is going to have to negotiate that power vacuum, right, in very practical ways. Um, at, you know, sort of another stage up from the ground, you have Juan Pablo, it's a Colombian military man. And he's the one planning this particular raid. But, you know, he's doing this from Tolomeda, right? He's doing this and he, you know, lives in Bogota. He's a Colombian elite, right? Um, and so his relationship to that region is very, you know, is very different <laughs> than, than Abel's. And he is working with Mason, who is the Special Forces liaison. And Mason is the American military man. And then sort of, you know, above that we have the journalist who's trying to fit it all together. And each one of them is sort of um, at odds with the institution that they're a part of, right? Um, and struggling against the institution that they're a part of in some way. And so the first half of the book deals with them, and then the second half of the book kind of moves into a third person where the kind of cast expand, and, and, and you see the consequences of this raid sort of unfold um, and change the lives of all the characters. And I knew from the very beginning when I was writing it that I was going to have those characters operating at the different levels. Yeah. Um, uh, I knew that Lisette was going to get kidnapped, right? It was, yeah. the, it was, the, it was the easiest way to, to link, because I needed to link all the characters at some point. Um, and then I think uh, I f wrote the Americans first because it was easier, right? Mm -hmm. I still, you know, I had to do more research for the Colombians. Um, though I still did a ton of research for the Americans. Uh, and then I, I wrote the American chapters first. Uh, uh, American chapters first, and then the Colombian chapters. Uh, and then uh, the sort of latter half of the book was kind of written in one big, long push. Um, and, you know, things changed along the way. You know, I invented a daughter for Juan Pablo, and then all of a sudden his relationship with his daughter became this incredibly important part of his story. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, you know, things changed along the way. But I had a basic idea of where I was going and how it was going to be structured. 
So I, I, I do want to I, I, I do want to take you back to those first chapters again in a second. But I, as you say it, it strikes me I didn't really quite understand the title of the book until mm-hmm. about halfway through. And, and 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 what I realize, and this is what you're sort of saying, is this is this distinction between strategy and tactics, right? And that these characters are all they're all judging themselves in terms of tactical success. There yeah. is the, but the mission is always very narrow, right? And the mission does come to an end with the capture or the kill or the this, and that they can call themselves successful, but, that, but the, the problem with the mission is that it doesn't understand the war. Yeah, know? yeah, that there's something much broader yeah. um, outside. And, and, and that's one of the reasons that the novel switches from the first to the third person, because yeah. they're engaged with these s- struggles within their institutions. You know, Mason thinks that special forces has lost its way, which, which it really has, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that's important. Um, but then the third person perspective doesn't really privilege any of those kind of self-conceptions where it's like a, you know, um, individual personal struggle with, you know, your place in this institution, how you make peace with it, and then... Um, you know, each of the kind of first-person narratives come to a kind of decision point or natural rest, and then the third person doesn't doesn't view the world and the consequences of these characters within it in terms of the kind of self-conception and narrative yeah. of, of of institutional struggle that they're a part of, um, and it sort of breaks beyond the the bounds of you know they're all sort of changing the world, and they have a sort of ideological superstructure above it, right? Yeah. Um, that is informing them as they do that, but they, um, yes, but they're all limited. And this is, there's a moment in the novel where there's, I, I can't remember the passage, but where somebody says, well, every mission in Afghanistan was a success, right? Or like, and makes it, sense, yeah. right? It's like rational, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, it's like the yeah. million little, like, rational missions that, like, yeah. you look at them all together and you're like, well, like, this is insanity, but, but it's like a all rational lo- insanity. They're all located at that level. Yeah. So it's interesting that you, again, please, I, I, I really w- am inviting people to ask we questions. We do have a question oh, yeah. over there. Did yeah. you see it? Please go ahead. One, one thing stood out for me, and I've, I've been studying conflict for a long time. I'm an amateur. I'm not a writer. I'm not an amateur. I don't aspire to be any of that, right? Um, but as a hobbyist, I've uh, studied conflict for a long time. Um, and one of the things you said that stuck out to me in that last statement of yours was that the special forces Mm-hmm. And I'd be interested to know how, in, in what fashion that is mm-hmm. the case nowadays in terms of the way they operate versus in terms of if I were to criticize them, for example, I could look at the camp and losing their way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So when, <laughs> I'll, I'll clarify that. So, um, yeah, one of the guys I interviewed uh, uh, was a Colombian military guy who went to the School of the Americas in uh, 1982, and all of his instructors were like retired American Special Forces guys. And this guy like, you know, like a right-wing, pragmatic, unapologetic, you know, retired Colombian military officer, talk about working with paramilitaries, you know. And even this guy, he was like, sus tacticas, Un poco agresivas, you know, like, it's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. So when I say lost their way, what I'm talking about is not, and, and this is related to that point about sort of like, there's like this sort of narrow institutional scope, and then like, okay, but what is the bigger picture? What is the bigger picture morally, culturally, spiritually, right? Um, Because, you know, the book opens not with a discussion of modern warfare, but a question about what a human being is, right? And what violence does to the human soul. Um, Special forces are supposed to be, um, like foreign internal defense is one of their, supposedly supposed to be one of their strengths. Working with local nation partners, building up institutions so that the, nation that you're operating in uh, can be more effective, right? Um, And the nation's military that you're working with can be more effective. So an example of that would be uh, American Special Forces guys um, 
helping kill Che Guevara, right? Okay. Um, now, in Afghanistan, that skill set, right? They're supposed to be the warrior diplomats. That skill set sort of atrophied, and it became very much a direct action unit, right? So, as one uh, special forces guy said to me, you know, we were going into the same valleys year after year, and we weren't doing, you know, we weren't building roads or schools or local governments. We didn't have any money for that. We were just doing interdiction mission after interdiction mission, getting into these gnarly firefights with the Taliban, and we're just chewing them up, right? Because like the Taliban's like, you know, we're, we're special forces, we have tons of assets, we're elite soldiers, and they're give, turning like kids at us, right? Like, they're kids. That's Right. Mm -hmm. and, and he goes, I used to wonder like why they kept fighting us, right? Like why they would send these kids up, and at a certain point I realized, oh, they're doing it because they can, right? And um, Mason is sort of in this, and he's like, what, what, the, he like, what the hell are we doing, right? Is this... Is this going to achieve any kind of political end state that we as a nation desire, right? And so he ultimately uh, decides that he likes, so like in the special forces communities, they'll do deployments to Colombia and deployments to Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, they're fighting in places where they know they're going to come back and fight in the same places again because like the Taliban's going to be right back as soon as they leave. Um, and as one guy said to me, he's like, this kind of like nihilistic warrior ethos developed, right? Because what else would in that circumstance? Because none of them believe that like, oh, we're building like a stable foundation for Jeffersonian democracy, right? Here, in the places that they're, they're being sent. And then on the other hand, they're going to Colombia, where uh, the Colombians are having sort of huge military success, right? And again, whatever you think of the ethics Right of what was going on in Colombia, and I assure you, you know the book is very much engaged in that. Um, militarily, there's no question it was extremely successful. Right, the the engagement. Um, in, it only took forty years. Yeah, but but, <laughs> but specifically the engagement sort of post Plan Colombia, yeah. right, and during the Uribe, right, military successes. Um, uh, not successes in the drug war, but that's a totally separate thing. Um, uh, and yet, the SF guys hated Colombia because they weren't allowed to get into, into fights, right? And uh, so he decides Colombia is actually the more important mission because it's, it's the mission where they're actually achieving their goals. And he doesn't want to be in a mission where people are getting <coughs> killed and they're killing people and people are losing their limbs and it's for what, right? Because it feels more important and impactful in the moment. Um, and so that's more what I'm talking about, that sort of cultural struggle within SF about what is this unit supposed to do and what is the point of what we're supposed to do. And that's why in the first half it's seen from Mason's perspective and sort of within that struggle where you think that's all important. And then that's specifically what I'm talking about with the sort of the second half of the book moves into a third person with those kind of questions. It's not that they disappear, but that like you're meeting like you know, like Colombian activists and, and, and other people who have radically different sensibilities in terms of, um, you know, how to, how to deal with violence in a region um, like the Norte de, uh, this part of Norte de Santander. I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, if I may, um, you mentioned the war on drugs as not successful while the diplomatic efforts that were making in Colombia are successful. Uh, military. Uh, military, yeah. Um, one of the big criticisms of the war on drugs in the Reagan administration in general is the hypocrisy involved in the war on drugs, and in fact, pushing, um, you know, crack in the city, all of that stuff, right? Which I'm not going to say they did or didn't, right? That's not my point. Um, there's arguments to be made for, and you're talking about the way it all interlinks as complex, everybody. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm curious to know your opinion in terms of 
if that's the failing side of it and the failure way it had plays a factor <coughs> in success. You know what I mean? You see where I'm going with this? Well so so the drugs from the conflict, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the it also funds corruption that then um, <sighs> weakens <laughs> weakens the government in areas that really do need development um, and 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 solve an effective governance. Um, and then a lot of the a lot of the anti-drug efforts that we do are counterproductive, or just like literally meaningless. I mean, this, the, the CIGAR, who's the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan, once put out a report where there was a graph of opium production in um, Afghanistan, and it was, the graph was like over time opium production, and it was tracked against the price of wheat, right? And like, if the price of wheat was up, like opium production would be down. If the price of wheat was higher, like opium, you know, the, was low, opium production would be up. And then, like along that time, it'd be like, here's when we spent like ten billion dollars. You know, here's when we spent this, and it would have no effect. You know, like zilch. I mean, it would have local effects, right? Like we do a ton of anti-drug stuff here, then like drug production would go down here specifically you know, where they're doing all that stuff, like literally while we're doing, like watching. And then, you know, there'll just be more stuff elsewhere. Um, and then there was some stuff that was directly counterproductive, like, you know, so like one of the big things is like spraying crops in, in Colombia. Um, so they'd spray coca crops. Well, that's not gonna do anything, right? Because yes, like the coca, like, it's, the, it's the, the, the actual plant that you're growing, it's the easiest thing to strike, right? But the money is not from the plant. Um, when, so like when a, uh, somebody buying coca leaves is incredibly cheap, right, at the source, right? You need to then, and like everything that happens adds value to it. You know, you turn that into cocaine laboratories, that adds a lot of value to it. You transport it across the border to Venezuela, that adds a lot of value to it. You get it out of Venezuela and into the United States, that adds a ton of value to it. And then you have to have a distribution network. And the distribution network is the other sort of side of the drug business that is very, that's easy for law enforcement to hit. And so that, you know, like the, you know, if you have, if you sell like a, a you know, uh, $100,000 worth of, of um, cocaine in like a, you know, in bricks uh, in Miami, like sold out on the street in like, you know, after it's been cut and all that, it'll be like, you know, 10 times that, right? But of course, that's extremely expensive. So like what you're buying as the end user is all of those stages. And, and the example that one uh, journalist used was saying like, so attacking the coca plant and thinking that you're going to affect um, even like the price of the drug once it gets to America is like attack, like destroying paint and thinking that it's going to change like the fine art market, right? Um, and so it doesn't do anything to the drug trade. What it does do is really hurt poor farmers and drive them further against the state, right? Because Huh? Their own, right? And, 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 and against sort of like um, any connection to legal actors because legal actors, you know, persecute them. Um, so, yeah, there's all sorts of counterproductive things that we do. Uh, and, but because it's like that's the easiest place to hit uh, because, you know, the plants have to grow in, in the soil and it's harder to hide them. Uh, that's what we do. And I think that a lot of what we do in the drug war and also in the military is we have complex social, cultural, economic, political problems. And we try to find simple, violent solutions for them. And that end up making things worse, right? Or just generating unnecessary suffering that doesn't make the, the situation better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.
So we have uh, maybe uh, 10, 15 more minutes, and I, I wanted to invite the students who are in this, in this room uh, to, to deep, dig down deep and come up with a question. Because, <laughs> because you have here, I know that many of you think that it might one day be interesting to be a writer, and many of you one day might be sitting up here, but are also wondering how the hell do I get from there to here? And it, it, there might be some value that, um, that Phil could offer you, or some, or some piece of advice, or some, or some in, sort of insight into his own process that, um, that you had not thought of. So is, uh, amongst the students, I know you're terrified, I know you're all put on your invisibility cloaks, but can, uh, would anyone like to ask uh, any kind of question, any of the students? Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> um, so you were speaking about, you were talking about how you went to college during uh, September 2001, mm -hmm. right? Would you say the impact of 9-11, especially during your period of college, influenced your choice to join the military and along this wanting to expand awareness and events going across the world? Yeah, so, you know, I was in the woods when 9-11 happened. Um, I was hiking the uh, Appalachian Trail. So I didn't experience 9-11 the way other people did. I mean, I'm from New York. Um, you know, my, my dad was not that far away from the World Trade Center when it happened. Um, but I didn't have that sort of visceral feeling of horror watching images that, a lot of, that was sort of central to a lot of people's experience. Um, when I came out of the woods, um, you know, it wasn't that sort of like, what's going to happen? What is going on? Um, why did this happen? Like a lot of those questions had sort of been settled. Um, and so I had a different relationship to it versus a country that it, in many ways had experienced a traumatic event, but also like whipped itself up into a kind of hysteria um, that was complicated. There were a lot of good things that happened people in relationship to that event and a lot of very bad things. Um, and I've written a little bit about that uh, recently. Um, but so it wasn't that I sort of like that 9-11 happened and I felt like we were attacked, I have to respond, right? Which is the way that some people felt. Um, it was more that 9-11 happened and because 9-11 happened, we went to war in Afghanistan. And then very soon after that, we went to war in Iraq. And all of a sudden, the major thing that my country was doing, the most important moral and political event of, of, of my life was overseas wars. And if I wanted to serve my country, right, even if we had a, you know, even if there was a sort of complicated, if you had complicated feelings about some of the things that were going on, then joining the military would be the way to do it, right? Um, and so that, that's how, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of emotional reaction to 9-11, so much as a sense that uh, we were at war and that was my responsibility as an American, right, to take part. Um, you know, I sort of, and I, I still do feel this, that sort of like, Service is extremely important. Putting your shoulder to the wheel is extremely important. Putting your shoulder to the wheel and being critical of what you're a part of is, is extremely important, right? Like, you know, um, every institution needs people who do not blindly follow the institutional mes mission but sort of question where it's going. Otherwise, because if you don't, then institutions um, are just going to decay and fall apart and make poor decisions because they don't have that kind of um, challenge. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that, that, that's, uh, and then, you know, sort of what I was a part of, you know, going to Iraq, and I didn't come back with like traumatic memories or anything like that, but I was, you know, I saw a lot of different aspects of the military as a public affairs officer. Uh, I'd do everything from sit on the battle update assessment briefs that went to General Odierno, who died recently, who was um, the second in command in all of Iraq, to like go out on patrol with infantry guys, you know, or spend time with mortuary affairs guys, the guys who were responsible for picking up the bodies of the dead um, and, and, and preparing them to be sent home, or, or, or nurses and doctors. And so, you know, um, 
seeing those different components of this of this thing that we were doing and then experiencing the weirdness of going home. You know, I'd seen a, a Marine die in a, a combat hospital in, in um, Ambar province like a week before I went home uh, on leave. And then I'm just like, in New York, you know? It's like a beautiful day. And it's like, well, this is, this is weird. These two worlds, right? Um, uh, which feel very, very disconnected. And yet the political decisions here in the happy New York world um, uh, are determinative of so much that happens in the place where that, that Marine died. Um, and what do I think about that, right? Um, you know, and, and what do I think about the, the you know, the children uh, injured by a suicide bomb that I carried to Navy doctors, right? Um, and both, you know, the sort of noble work that was being done to heal them and the fact that the catastrophic violence that that society had gone through was very much a direct result of a poorly planned invasion um, and uh, occupation afterwards, right? Um, and yeah, I still think that through. I was in Iraq in December of 2019. I went through Mosul, I went through Sinjar, where there was a genocide of Yazidis, right? Um, and it's very difficult to go through those places and see the unbelievable suffering that can be brought about um, as a result of the sort of second and third order consequences of our military action that we didn't anticipate did, uh, or adequately um, plan for and not think that writing about these things and thinking about these things as an American citizen is just an absolute moral imperative. You, are, 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 you do such a good job of dealing with that in the, in the book. I, I will come to these questions, um, but I wanted to, again, we're selling books, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 the different relationships that people like Ocho and Mason, but then, yeah. but then, but then Juan Pablo have to the, the, that yeah. kind of ambivalence is so powerful in it, in that, in that I think that, like, I mean, and, and they're also their, their affect, like their, their mm. sensibilities are so different, but you get that most power, and this is where I think it's, you get that most powerfully in the narrative of, uh, of a Colombian lieutenant colonel whose yeah. father is a disgraced general yeah. and who's being pushed out of the military and who, who has such deep ambivalence in him about his place in the military, and yet he is also this deeply patriotic figure that I think you crafted that character quite, in, that, in the you. way that you're describing. Mm. Oh, sorry, let me take the question, these two questions. I'll take both questions and then you can ask. Go ahead, Bob. Well, I just want to say, Semper, uh, thank you for your service and Semper Fi. Hoorah. I'm um, a veteran for peace, and I've noticed that if, for like a long time, I wanted to see our troops come home from Afghanistan, but it makes little sense if, in doing so, we're going to be firing more drones with more missiles. Mm. Yeah. More kamikaze drones, and now we we'll find out that we have seven nations out there that are using drone warfare. But it did seem like drones were very effective in surveillance. And if they had been used that way in Colombia, only that way, then you, do you think they would have been successful? Because. You know, there's a lot of focus on drones, and I understand why. I think that at the end of the day, it's a tool, right? Um, it's a tool that allows us to feel more distanced from and protected from the consequences of, of what we do. Um, you know, but like, I mean, surveillance is a very critical part of being able to kill people, <laughs> right? Um, the, the raid that I describe I with the teddy bear, right? Drones are used in that raid, right? Um, the drones are not armed, uh, but their surveillance enables killing, right? Um, but yes, I, I mean, as far as the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan goes, I agree with you. You know, I, I find it disturbing. There's a kind of double speak that we've just kind of accepted about American war making, where, you know, Joe Biden announces the end of the war in Afghanistan, and in the same speech, in like the next sentence, promises that we're going to continue to kill people in Afghanistan using over the horizon strikes. Right. Um, I mean, it's a very weird thing when you can say that we're not at war, but we're still killing people, right? That sounds kind of like war, you know? It's like Canada was just regularly sending drones over to kill people here. We wouldn't be like, oh, 
That's just Canada. You're not it's supposed not, to talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they do that. It's not really war. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that um, I, supported, I supported the withdrawal, but I think that uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves that we do not have a, a lethal presence in a lot of countries around the world. Actually, there's about seven or eight countries where we're actively killing people. There are four more where we may or may not be directly involved in killing, but we don't know. We have operators pushed down to tactical levels, um, and we don't get a lot of information about that. And we accept from our political leaders that they don't owe us much transparency about where and when we're killing people. The Congress doesn't feel like it has to vote on those things, right? The, there was an authorization of, for the use of military force that was passed right after 9-11 that gave the president pretty broad powers, right, to attack al-Qaeda and associated forces. And during the Obama administration, associated forces was expanded to mean lots of things, including groups that didn't exist during 9-11, including groups with, in Africa with very limited ties um, to al-Qaeda that, you know, um, uh, and so, you know, we're no, we no longer have even political debates uh, about uh, very lethal campaigns that we're running in, in multiple countries because politically we've created a set of circumstances where we don't have to. And I think that's, I think that's a, a real problem. I think it's a problem practically insofar as I don't think that presidents privately using lethal force without much oversight are likely to achieve long-term strategic goals. Um, and also sort of morally in terms of as a, as a republic, you know, if we're killing people around the world, our elected leaders should be regularly debating it and voting on it. Mark is telling us to stop at one more question and then we'll have a quick, yeah. Right. Um, so you were a public affairs officer. Yes. You just described you saw some horrific things. Mm -hmm. Did you have to lie about what you saw since you were embedded, you were an employee mm -hmm. of the military? Were you censored? And obviously you've thought deeply about this, written a novel, the, the morally compromised mm -hmm. position. Would you recommend the Marines for these bright young people in this sure. room, or would you say stay away from them? No, I didn't lie. Uh, I mean, no, I didn't lie. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's at least one German journalist that did lie uh, <laughs> during the time that I was there. Um, uh, you know, sometimes the press is ideological. Um, you know, the, the mission of, of, of a public affairs officer is to get accurate information out to the public. I mean, a lot of what you're doing is, is providing information about what the troops are doing to families back home. You also coordinate interviews. Uh, you bring in journalists from the outside. And those journalists can write whatever you, they want. Now, like, look, the fact of the matter is you work for the military. You want to show them good stuff. You want to look in a good light, right? That's how it works. Um, you know, uh, if I uh, had gone to my commanding officer and was like, hey, let's show the journalists all the bad stuff, that conversation would not have gone well, right? Uh, so there's a matter of kind of institutional bias and, 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 you know, you believe in the mission, you believe in what you're doing, and you want to show the successes, not the failures, because like, you know, that's what you want to do, right? Um, but no, you don't lie. Uh, or at least I didn't lie, um, and I didn't feel particularly censored, right? Um, in terms of, um, and I, I didn't, f I would never have, have told somebody to censor themselves. Um, you know, the only time that I saw somebody do that was it wasn't a political thing. So we organized a, a sort of video teleconference back with this town that this National Guard unit had been from. And uh, they picked a bunch of soldiers to do it. And so these guys were selected. These were like, you know, it wasn't like, oh, let's give them the misfits. It was like guys were picked to represent the unit to like their families back home at this like town hall from the town that this National Guard unit was from. And they'd been through all of 2006, which was extremely violent, and the early part of 2007, which was extremely violent. So they just had violence and violence. And then they were going home. And they felt really bleak about, you know. And so they were like, well, what do we tell them? You know, and they were like, uh, well, we're not going to tell them the truth. You know, we'll save that for when we get home. Like, they think this is for us, but actually it's for them. And then it was like, well, are we even going to tell them the truth about how we feel once we get home? 
how long before we tell them the truth, right? If ever. Um, and, you know, that was just like a conversation they were having amongst themselves. And I didn't step in and was like, you need to tell your mom <laughs> how it felt when the day that you were supposed to get home, but your deployment had been extended four months. You ended up doing 16 months in Iraq rather than 12. Two of your friends died, and then you had to pick up their body parts, right? Um, I did not tell them to say that, right? Uh, so no, I didn't. I wasn't. I wasn't censored, but there are sort of natural constraints around how honest you're going to be, right, and how much of the truth you're going to tell. Um, so, uh, but the, you know, the funny thing is, I think that people in the military. I mean, this book is very critical of U.S. military policy, right? Um, or at least, if you read it, it should raise a lot of questions about how we're using military force around the world. And what's interesting to me, and it's very critical of stuff that happened during the Obama administration. Obama liked the book, a former commander of Southern Command, right? Which, you know, would handle the American military presence in Colombia, spoke very favorably about the book, wrote a piece about, that, that, that talked about it. Um, uh, a former uh, Special Operations Command commander uh, also spoke very favorably about the book. And so I think that, you know, within the military, there's like this control, but also I think that ev people that, at, leadership positions also understand like you know look it's it, we look back at the t past two decades it's not like the american military's record has been one of just like stunning success right mm -hmm. and so if you're actually interested as a professional right in like what went wrong like you you do want to hear from people who are not just telling you that you know you fart sunshine so uh, we're, we're, calling it a, we're calling it a day. We're not going to let you answer the Marines question. If you want to know whether or not he thinks you should join the Marines, you have to buy his book. And he will I, write, he I'll, will I'll, write I'll very quickly. I would just say it, was a, it, was, it will always have been an honor to have been a Marine officer. Right? It's a complicated thing. But he, uh, he will be yes. signing copies. So he'll be signing copies out, out, outside. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Phil, so much for that. Yeah.